This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 28th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the final outcome of the budget during this special session. Second, we explain why some who claim to be pro-business are really pro-business executive instead and why that's a huge difference. And third, we examine what we think is the biggest failure this legislative session. And now, let's join Michael. I guess we should deal with the elephant in the room, and that is the uh, the budget and this sense of the House vote and this bicameral committee that is going to solve everything. That's what they tell us. It's going to, this is the solution, or at least this was the justification for many who decided to vote in favor of the new uh, effective date vote. Let, let's focus on the big win that the conservatives had uh, in in these last uh, few days on the budget, uh, and that I think uh, has the potential to change the dynamic. Okay. Uh, and, and the big win is the refusal to agree to the CBR vote uh, and the uh, uh, reverse sweep uh, that that uh, that that implies, keeping in the air. Uh, a number of things, uh, but among those things, uh, two things that that uh, are important to a big faction of the legislature, uh, the uh, PCE and the higher ed uh, scholarship funds, which essentially is a, uh, a subsidy for uh, the university system. Um, and, and I think having those two things in the air, having the CBR uh, vote uh, in the air gives uh, the conservative side, the fiscally conservative side, leverage in a way that they haven't had before uh, going into uh, subsequent negotiations. Now, there are other things they could have won uh, that they didn't, um, uh, but but I think that is uh, a big win that, that sets up a somewhat different dynamic uh, going into the August session uh, than we've had before. There are things now that the other side uh, wants uh, uh, and uh, wants out of the conservative side. They want that two thirds or three quarters vote. Uh, and uh, and there are things now the conservatives have, uh, there, there's leverage the conservatives now how to play with that. I'm not, I'm not thinking that um, the bicameral uh, working group is going to, is going to have a big impact on this. They've only got, I mean, we need to, we need to focus on the fact they've only got a month. There's only a month now between the end of this session and the beginning uh, of the special session on August 6th. Right. Uh, and I don't think the bicameral work, I mean, they're not even formed yet. So I don't think the bicameral working group is really going to have a, a huge impact on that process. We've been through this before you noted it earlier. We, we had one um, uh, two years ago. Uh, in the 2019-2020 session, they met for six six months. Over a span of six months, they really didn't get anything accomplished. There may be there may be a usefulness to the bicameral working group. This this bicameral working group, if the the fiscal conservatives are represented on it and are able to uh, you know articulate uh, 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 their position in a way that sort of you know gets through to the other side. The last 
uh, bicameral working group really only had out of the eight members that really only had one, Shelley Hughes, who you right. can describe as a fiscal conservative. The other seven were, I mean, it was Click Bishop, Jennifer Johnson, Adam Wool, uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, Kelly Merrick, Bert Stedman, and Donnie Olson uh, is, is a pro PFD, but uh, sort of goes back and forth. But it, if if there's if there's a true representation of the conservative side, both out of the House minority and out of the Senate majority. Uh, that actually might help penetrate the fog a little bit. It might, right. might start the discussion. Well, and let's talk about that for just a hot second, uh, since, I mean, it's going to have supposedly equal representation from each caucus. So House majority, House minority will have equal representation chosen by their members, not by the speaker. Uh, and then uh, on the same thing on the Senate side, I mean, this will be kind of like a make or break point for Senate President Peter Michicki, who has said that uh, what happened with the conference committee shouldn't have happened. He's gotten an apology from, you know, for all the chicanery and the arm twisting and the blackmail and all that. And it shouldn't have happened and it won't happen again. So the question is. Is he going to blink on this? Is he going to provide? Is he going to produce uh, or, or I guess place, um, you know, the fiscal conservatives who really haven't gotten a bite at this apple? Uh, is he going to place them on the bicameral working group, or will this be the Bert Stedman and Click Bishop uh, Natasha von Imhoff triad that we've seen pretty much go into every fiscal position of power so far in the Senate? Well, it yeah, it'll be interesting to see who gets placed on there, but but again, they're only going to have a month. I mean, right, it's uh, right, right. It, it's not it's not like I mean, and they're supposed to have two public meetings in the in the, you know, it, the, the the letter agreement or the or the sense of the House uh, resolution was written in, in a way that would make you think that this was going to go for a while. Uh, you know, it was going to have two public meetings and and it was going to have a deliberative session or deliberative sessions that was going to lead to a recommendation. It's only a month. I mean, I don't, it, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to visualize how you're going to cram much of anything uh, into a month before the, before the August special uh, session starts. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I don't hold out too much hope for it, but you're right. I mean, it's, it, it will be, it will be an indicator uh, and certainly a, a, a hot spot for who the, uh, uh, the presiding uh, 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 officers appoint to the committee. I I would assume uh, that it will be a you know a, a, another eight member body, so you get two from each from each caucus. Uh, so you would have what room for a Burt and a room for a, a Shelley, for example. Right. Uh, on on the Senate side and on the House side, House Minority side. Uh, <laughs> I hate to say this, but you would have room for a Steve Thompson or a Bart LeBon uh, and room for uh, a, Tom McKay, uh, a, a Tom McKay or a, or a uh, 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 Kevin McKay. McCabe. Uh, you, you, yeah. you, you'd have room for you would have room for one of each. But, you know, again, it's only a month. So how much how much are you going to accomplish in a month? Yeah, no. It's a good question. Um, let's talk about uh, with the vote and everything. This does form the effective date. But it leaves the budget woefully underfunded because they didn't get because, I mean, they decided to tie all these things to all these different funds, most of which required a three quarters vote. This is almost kind of like the karmic backbiting of coming back to bite them because they could have gotten just a, you know, just a simple majority vote. But because they tried to tie all this stuff up and twist arms, now they're finding that their budget is completely underfunded and they're going to have to do something different. I mean, does this still give the minority leverage in your opinion? Oh, absolutely! It gives the minority leverage. I mean, it, it gives it gives the minority leverage in the sense that the minor, the majority is going to want to get uh, PCE funded. They're not going to want it to roll into the CBR and stay in the CBR for an extended period of time. Uh, as I say, the the college funds there's going to there's going to be a hue and cry over the college funds. Already, you can already see it uh, uh, starting, and and they're going to the majority is going to want those things uh, uh, done. Uh, that gives the minority uh, leverage, I think, in a way, as I say, in a way they haven't had before and and should open some eyes to uh, to negotiations about, you know, finding finding common ground between a PFD, a, 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 a meaningful, full PFD, whatever full means these days, um, and uh, and and some accommodation with respect to the to the CB with respect to the PCE and and 
the higher ed college fund. So um, I, I think it does give them leverage, and and I and I and I do think that there is going to be negotiations now. Whether that can be accomplished in the in in the in the scope of uh, of, of the August spe- special session, uh, I'm not sure. And then there's there's one thing that we've talked about before that that needs to be injected here. If we're gonna, if if the August special session is in fact going to result in a in a permanent fiscal plan, in a full permanent fiscal plan, there needs to be revenues on the table, and the governor has yet to come to the table with a proposal on revenues. And if he doesn't do that, I don't hold out much hope uh, for getting a, a successful resolution of the. Uh, in of a full permanent fiscal plan uh, in the August session. So there's a lot of moving parts, but the conservatives have created leverage for themselves by uh, by uh, successfully blocking the uh, the CBR vote. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, a lot of people are you know kind of upset by this boat. They were willing to bl- they were willing to to play chicken to not blink to take the government to the uh, to the shutdown level to try and focus on these issues and get it, and they feel. Uh, I mean, we we kept being told, oh, the minority solid, the minority solid, and here we see that the 20 members split, or the 19 or 18, whatever it is, split with 10 voting against it, some voting for it. Uh, people feel betrayed. What are your thoughts on that? And then what are your questions? What if you had to sit down with people like Kathy Tilton and Laddie Shaw and some of these others? What would your questions to them be uh, on that? My question would be why why didn't you search for an alternative of something like a continuing resolution that kept the government going but kept uh, kept the, kept these issues alive? We've we've solved we've we've put off potentially put off uh, the uh, all of these disputes and the resolution of all of these disputes by another year by having a um, by having a a, a full year budget uh, uh, passed. Um, the CBR, I think, is the one tool that that keeps issues open and and creates leverage uh, into August. But I'm not. Um, you, you could have kept more issues open. You could have created more leverage uh, had you not uh, voted for the full budget. And I think maybe the one the one thing that I would ask, the one thing I would explore is why didn't you do uh, a continuing resolution? Why didn't you? Keep the negotiations going. Keep the pressure on. Keep the uh, keep the process uh, uh, continuing uh, until we got a a more firm resolution of these longer term issues. Instead of just this non binding sense of the house, where they basically even said in the language of it, "Well, we don't guarantee anything's going to happen, but we'll try our best." Yep. Yep. It, 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 instead of instead of that. Yeah. As I say, the success. I mean, let's let's focus on the one su- the success. Which is the, the 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 CBR vote, the 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 failure to, you know, to to do the reverse sweep on the on the PCE and on the college funds. Right. That's a success, and I and I think we need to I think we need to note that as a success. Could we could have gotten more um, uh, if uh, if we had kept this the the pressure on. Uh, I mean, the pressure would have been on the progressives as well as on the on the conservatives to. You know, to get this to get this issue to get the budget resolved and to and to get on with state government, but by by doing this, by voting for a full year budget, um, uh, we've essentially taken some of the pressure off uh, on the uh, on the progressive side. Uh, they've got they've got now full year funding, not everything they want. That's why we're going to August. That's why August has uh, opened some potential, but uh, but now they've got another full year funding. I mean. Brad is trying to paint the sunny side of the street here with the wind that we got out of this. But Brad, I mean, in the long run, is this, I mean, there, there are some positives, don't get me wrong, but is this really a win or is this a squandered and wasted opportunity? I mean, should the minority have held together stronger? Should the, some of these members pulled back and said, you know, look, we're not getting exactly what we want. Should it be more ironclad rather than this amorphous sense of the house? Which, again, even in the last minute, they tried to screw around with the minority members on and tried to get the uh, effective date vote before the sense of the house vote. Uh, you know, and then oh no, no, that's a miscommunication. And anyway, I got members in the, I got representatives in the chat room who are saying, well, that was bullpucky. They knew exactly what they were doing. I mean, is this a missed opportunity? Well, Michael, it, it depends. I mean, do you think 
it, it depends on, on your, your position on this. Do you think that uh, forcing the legislature to go into sort of continuous session uh, with a government either shut down or pending a shutdown, just you know, on the precipice of a shutdown, do you think that would create enough pressure on the uh, progressive side to uh, successfully resolve uh, the PFD issue on a, on a long-term basis? That's, that's really the issue. And if you think that it would, that that the conservatives would be able to withstand the uh, the the complaints, challenges, uh, objections, demonstrations of everybody who was sort of sitting on the precipice as the as the government uh, you know as, as funding teetered. If you think the conservatives would be able to withstand that, and that the progressives would fold in a way that would allow, that would enable a long term resolution, then yeah, this was a miss, missed opportunity. If you think it's if you think all of that would end the same way as it did in 2019, when the governor did uh, his uh, uh, his deep vetoes on spending, uh, and there was a huge outpouring of of uh, pressure that resulted in essentially the rollback of those vetoes. If you think if you think that's the way this was going to end up uh, by going into continuing resolution, then. Um, then I don't know. It, I don't know if it is a missed opportunity. I, I, we, we, we might have created too much. It might have created too much of a backlash to, to, to be successful. But that's that's the key point. What's your view about about where things would go if government kept teetering, uh, kept teetering on the edge of, of of being unfunded? I think, to me, I think the better course is to step back from the brink. Um, seeing what happened in 2019, seeing the pushback that occurred, seeing the governor ultimately cratering uh, on those on those cuts, I think the better course is to take the win that we got, the CBR, um, and to go into the August session uh, to try to resolve this. And again, I, I, I know people will disagree with me, but but the, to me, and I think to to reality. There's a huge piece that's missing from getting to a final resolution, and that is that is the revenues. I mean, even Mike Shower says that, Shelley Hughes says that, uh, David Wilson has said that. There's going to have to be a revenue piece of 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 reaching a resolution, and and that's not yet on the table. So, you know, going through this 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 sort of you know teetering on the precipice approach without that piece being there as a part it, it already being in play and 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 having an idea about it as being part of the resolution i'm not sure how how that was going to play out um that the governor needs to cut as i've said on previous programs the governor needs to come to the august session with revenues um uh at, with a revenue piece uh to fit into the jigsaw to, to to put a full picture together and um and until he does that i i'm not sure we get to a final resolution long story short it's not necessarily a win, but it's not necessarily a loss. Am I reading that right? Yeah, it's it's you know it, you have to sort of you have to sort of you know think through what would have happened in this alternate universe where if, if we would have held out, shut the government down, or or you know just kept going on a on a week to week uh, continuing resolution. What how would that have played out? And I just um, I'm not confident that would have played out given what happened in 2019. I'm not confident that would have played out well. Uh, so I think we take the win we got on the CBR. We have that leverage going into August. The governor's got to come to the table with uh, with with the final with the other piece of the jigsaw puzzle uh, to put it together uh, in August. That piece has that piece isn't there, hasn't been there, and that piece is necessary for uh, uh, to to complete uh, to complete the puzzle and put everything together. Well, and to just give you a little bit of a snapshot, I think of what Brad is talking about. I mean, when he's talking about the 2019 budgets and how the special interests came out of the woodwork, they just came unglued. We saw a bit of that in the House Finance Committee, where the Chamber of Commerce and all these business interests got up there and belly ached for a couple hours about how the shutdown was going to kill everybody. And and I think that was just a snapshot of what we could expect moving forward. And so I think I I agree with that in that dis, uh, in that regard anyway. Give us a quick uh, forty second tease on number two before we jump to the break. There's there's an issue that uh, I think we need to really start focusing on, which is 
uh, who do who do these repre- who, who's re- who are, are these representing representatives representing? Uh, Matt Buxton's got a piece in the in in his blog uh, Friday in the Sun, uh, and he keeps referring to Steve Thompson and to Bart Lebon as pro business representatives. They're not really. Uh, they're pro business exec. Uh, executive top 20 executive representatives are not rep- really representing business and I think we need to start focusing on who what segments these representatives are really uh, representing when we when we talk about uh, when we talk when, when we go forward and talk about the positions everybody's taking continuing now Brad Keith Lee number two on our agenda what is a pro business Republican? Is it really a pro business Republican or is it a pro business executive Republican? What exactly are we talking about here? Brad is going to give us his insight and thoughts on uh, this second of the weekly top three. There, there's, there's been a, um, a, a, a process going on that that you know identifies certain republicans as pro business republicans and thus you know of some status of some importance of some significance uh of some credibility uh because they're representing alaska business and 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 you know we need to take care of business because that's you know the business of government is is to is to promote uh the private sector promote and protect the private sector and so those pro business republicans uh, are are people who ought to be given a lot of uh, deference and a lot of a lot of respect. He, here's here's the thing that's dawned on me over time. Those those pro business Republicans aren't pro business. What they're doing, what they are, is pro biz, pro top twenty percent business exec Republicans. Um, pro business. Uh, when you view the pro the PFD issue, pro business is pro PFD. Why? Because since 2016, since the ICER 2016 study, everybody's been on notice that that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. PFDs are the most pro-business. Paying PFDs is the most pro-business thing you can do. Cutting PFDs is the most uh, uh, anti-business thing you can do because it has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. So pro business means pro PFD. What you've got with these pro business, these alleged pro business Republicans, Thompson and uh, uh, and Laban and others, what they're really looking out for is the is the top twenty percent business execs. We've got we've got business people uh, who articulate these positions at the PFD. We can use we can do without the PFD. That's not. They're not looking out for the business side of the Alaska economy. They're looking out for their own personal interests because they know if we don't use PFD, uh, PFD cuts or to fund government, we're going to have to come for some other revenue, and they're going to have to pay uh, a share of that revenue. So what what you're really what what really is going on is is Thompson and Laban and other and Jennifer Johnston before them and others are really looking out for those top 20% execs. They're not looking out for business. They're looking out for those top 20% uh, top 20% execs. The people who are really looking out for business are the are the uh, Ben Carpenters and the Kevin McCabe's and the Tom McKay's and the and, and and the others who are who are pushing to keep the PFD uh, at uh, at its uh, uh, statutory levels, or at its uh, at its uh, POMV 50/50 levels, they're the ones who are really looking out for the bulk of Alaska business because the PFD is so tied to the success of the economy. And and so when you when you think about who's really you've got you've got to think through this when you think about who's pro business, it's really those who are pushing the PFD who are protecting the PFD. Who are promoting the PFD because it's so integral to the success of Alaska business, and these others are are just are, are top twenty percent defenders um, uh, in disguise. They don't care about the over. I mean, one of our, one of the things I've said about Natasha over and over and over is she doesn't really care about the overall Alaska economy. She cares about her economy. Right. And what she's trying to protect is her economy, right. the top 20% economy. We've got the same thing out of Thompson. We've got the same thing out of Lebon. And we need to start making that point 
to, so, so that we have correctly identified who's looking out for Alaska business and who's looking out instead for Alaska business execs. Well, as somebody in the chat room mentioned it, and I've talked about it in the past, it's crony capitalism. I mean, you've got a whole group. I mean, the Finance Committee the other day, the House Finance Committee, was full of businesses who've built their whole business model around government expenditure. And as you said, they don't, they're not caring about the economy as a whole. They're caring about their own little orbit, their own little circuit around the economy. Let the government money flow because that's what affects our bottom line, not what hits the economy overall. And that's, I mean, that's the basis of crony capitalism on top of it. You, you, you've, that's that's one piece of it. That's one piece of it. And you've certainly got people, I mean, Zach Fields is that. Zach Fields is, is is looking out for unions and for government employees and government businesses um, uh, uh, to the to, to the to the to the at the cost of his his own 80 percent lower middle income Alaska families uh, in his own district. That's certainly the case with people like Zach Fields. But Thompson and Laban are a little bit different. Thompson and Laban aren't so much looking out for government related government sector businesses government sector related businesses although that's a little bit that's a little bit of it because of the university up in the up in the importance of the university up in the Fairbanks area but they're more looking out for top 20% um, uh, 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 Alaskans who would have to pay something for the cost of government if uh, if we stop using stop using PFD cuts i don't think natasha i don't think natasha is a crony capitalist i don't think she's looking out for you know, necessarily looking out for government run, government sector, uh, private businesses that are tied to the government sector. I think she's just looking out for top 20 percent Alaskans. She's looking out for herself and her donor class uh, to make sure that they don't have to pay. And the and 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 the and the and the coalition that they formed to do that is is basically, uh, you know, Natasha saying, I'll support government spending as long as you don't make me pay for it. Right. And and getting getting her a coalition that will that will control the legislature that does exactly that. You continue government spending as long as the top 20 percent don't have to pay for it. We, we need to call these people out. We need to call Thompson, Laban and others who claim to be pro-business, who wrap themselves in the pro-business flag. We need to call them out for what they are, which is they're just top 20 percent uh, representatives of the top 20 percent. They're not looking out. For overall Alaska business, they're not looking out for the overall Alaska economy. They're just looking out for their income bracket uh, and people in their income bracket. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. That on top of the snarkiness in that article was just enough to make my head spin. We're talking about the Matt Buxton article, and that was the whole sniveling comment. From I mean, I've never heard Ben Carpenter snivel in my life, but that's again, that's the hot take on it from uh, some of these guys. Uh, let's move on to uh, number three. Uh, and see if we can squeeze it in here in the last three and a half, four minutes. Uh, the biggest failure uh, this year for the Alaska legislature, and I think you just touched on it a minute ago, talking about the largest effect, but give me number three. Number th- I think I think the fundamental problem that we have in the legislature is, you know, everybody talks about transparency and how transparent they're being with Alaskans about the budget. They aren't. The, 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 there has been no discussion this past session no analysis this past session of who pays for Alaska government and who pays through using PFD cuts is middle and lower income Alaska families. You've not seen one distributional analysis, what economists call or tax people call a distributional analysis, which is who's paying, who, who's bearing the burden of various, uh, of various fiscal uh, formats, fiscal approaches. You've not seen one distributional analysis out of either OMB or ledge finance. All this talk about transparency ends when when you get down to focusing on who's really paying the bill, and I think that lack of transparency is 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 part of the problem because middle and lower income Alaska families don't understand, are not being told, there's not being a demonstration of how much of the burden is being shoved off on them by by the top 20 percent i think we would have a different reaction going on if we if we made di- these distributional analyses these analyses of who pays under these various revenue approaches i think we would have a different reaction uh going on if uh, if that was part of the root of the of the routine presentations that that were made both by omb and ledge finance because then you would see 
and the new newspapers would have a basis for picking up that, oh, PFD cuts shove this burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. Top 20% are paying a trivial amount. Non-residents are paying nothing right. uh, toward the cost of government. I think you would have a different reaction if we had those sorts of distributional analyses done. And so to me, the biggest failure uh, of this past legislature, all of this talk about transparency aside, the biggest failure of this last legislature is is the failure to have these sorts of analyses that are showing who's actually paying the bill under the diff- different approaches that the that the committees and uh, the members are rolling out. And surprisingly enough, Brad Keithley has actually done some of these distributional analysis, and you can take a look at them on his website or out on his Facebook page. Uh, and you pointed this out, but nobody's picking it up except for you. Brad, I'd be lying if I just said I wasn't so frustrated with this whole process at this point. Uh, it just seems like it's two steps forward uh, and and three steps back almost every time we deal with this. We thought we had an opportunity here to focus some of these things, but we still don't have a unified. We still don't have unified messaging coming out of the minority or the conservative coalition in the uh, Senate, and we really are missing this leadership that you and I have talked about. Uh, you know, from uh, from the uh, from the governor. I mean, he came out strong here a couple a week ago or so on the program, and and uh, in fact, many of the I thought found it hysterical that many of the legislators and news outlets mentioned that he was on the radio talking of being so strident, but he still has not come out with some of these kind of, like you said, the the revenue, uh, fixing the revenue component and doing some of these other things. And so it's like it's a start, stop, start, stop, but we have no leadership and we have no unifying message. If they had come out with a unifying message that you've been talking about, largest impact on Alaska families, what is pro-business, what is the distributional analysis, all those things, they'd be hard pressed to be able, they couldn't hide from those. Yeah, Michael, it's a, it's a, it is a disappointment. I, I again, we we need to we need to celebrate victories where we get them and 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 the CBR vote I think is a victory and I think we need to use that I need we, we need to recognize it as that we need to use that we need not to give that up <coughs> excuse me easily uh, uh, in the August session without getting some trade off for it uh, and 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 I think that's that's a plus but you know there are we we didn't we didn't get all the way there but part of the reason we have and all the way there is we have the revenue side. It's the revenue side. Believe me, the revenue side. But believe Shelley, believe Shower, believe David Wilson. The revenue side is, is a piece, a, a necessary part of the puzzle. You can't put the puzzle together until you have that revenue side. So even if we'd funded government day to day, even if we'd done continuing resolutions on a day to day basis, that final piece of the puzzle isn't there. Uh, to fit in and 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 make it all work. So, it, it we we we've got we've got to celebrate the, the the success of the CBR vote, but we've got to keep continuing to say, Governor, you've got to come to the table uh, with the revenue piece because we're not going to be able to get a, a, an entire resolution done until you do that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, is there anything we didn't get to today that you really wanted to get to in regards to all this mess going on? You know, I, the distributional piece, Michael, I think I, I, I put it as number three. It will probably work its way up the list. But 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 I I hope that that what we see is is people starting to ask for distributional pieces, because when I, I had this long exchange with Sarah Rasmussen in Facebook that I that I that I that sort of brought this to light to me. She said, I you know, I said, why do you why do you, you know, support PFD cuts? And basically it's because. My constituents don't want to have, uh, don't want to pay taxes. Well, your consti- the, you look at that district; it, it is like other districts. I mean, it's more heavily 20, 20, top twenty percent, but there's still a large segment of middle and lower income Alaska families. They don't understand; they're not seeing the information necessary to understand that that the costs are being shoved to them, that the top twenty percent are getting off very lightly, and, and non-residents are paying nothing. They're not seeing that, so. I hope the distrib- that I hope that that people start talking about this, these distributional analyses and start talking about what's happening to middle and lower income Alaska families and start talking about things like you know Steve Thompson, Bart Lamond are not representing Alaska business; they're representing Alaska business execs, and that's something entirely different. And and I agree with that. And I I think again you've hit this is a this is a conjunction of both 
uh, people, you know, protecting the top 20 percent and the business executives. And at the same time, you also have this push back when Governor Dunleavy produced that 2019 budget that was so cutting was that you have, again, that crony capitalism piece that we talked about where you've got businesses that are and special interests. Uh, that are like not businesses, but like unions and other things that are, you know, that are completely committed to this spending because they need it. They built their whole business model and their life around it. And when you put those two things together, that's I mean, that is the perfect storm right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And we and we and we just need to talk about that. We need to talk about the stakes that are in it for middle and lower income Alaska families. We need to be transparent and help them understand what this government is doing to them every time that they cut the PFD. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think it it, uh, it this is this has done one thing. It's given us, I think, uh, more life. It's shown some of the moves by the legislature, including this arm twisting. Uh, when you explain it to people, they get very upset when the when when you see the kind of arm twisting that was going on and the games that were being played. Uh, I think more and more Alaskans are getting engaged. My question is, when it comes up to the constitutional convention question, which is going to be on the ballot this next year, does it get picked? Do you think? Well, I don't know. There, you go to a constitutional convention, you open up all sorts of things. I know. I know. Uh, That's always been my contention with it. But is it the only way we get things like a protected PFD in there? Is it the only way we get that done? It may be. Uh, and, and, and maybe the threat of that and opening up all of the other things that a constitutional convention would open up will be motivation, will create motivation for people to resolve the PFD issue before we, before we get there. Um, I, I, I want to try to work on the PFD. I want to try to work on getting a fiscal resolution, uh, uh, without having to go to a full constitutional convention, because I'm not sure we know what's going to come out of a full constitution. Right. Convention. I mean, you open up that door and uh, there could be unintended consequences, and I'm never a fan of that for sure. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. I appreciate you being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. You can find Brad over at ak4sb.com or links at the top of this video for Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. That's where you go to make all this work. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.